Okay, welcome to Talmudim Way Gospel Backgrounds Series, Lesson 21, and this is called the Apostles' Discourse. Primarily, we'll be in Matthew chapter 10. We'll pick up a, so a couple of miracles that are at the end of Matthew 9, and then the parallel passages are Mark 6 and then Luke 9. There is a, a nearly identical passage in Luke 10, but we will um, dig into that later to see what some of the dis distinctions are. Again, we always want to start with Acts 17.11, and specific to this section, we're going to have some textual questions at the end of Mark, uh, Matthew 9, where we're going to find that some of the material is repeated nearly verbatim in other parts of the Gospels. So we, it, for these, we will need to put on our Acts 17.11 thinking caps and examine the scriptures and, and try to discern whether these represent separate events or if there's a retelling of the same event for a specific purpose. Um, I'll, I'll be upfront, I don't have the answers. Um, very few of the commentators picked up on this, but uh, we'll just, we'll dig into it and see where we go. So our topics here, I'm just gonna throw these out and then we'll get into them as we go along. So there's two blind men are given their sight and then right after that, a mute man uh, is is given is given the ability to speak and that's actually a, a demon exorcism in another section of Matthew it's a nearly identical uh, uh, set of circumstances except for the the man is mute and blind so we'll look into that and then really the bulk of the uh, lesson will be on the commissioning of the apostles in the Sermon on the Mount Jesus said don't cast your pearls before swine which basically uh, he's going to elaborate on that uh, in this lesson where he's going to talk about if you go to a house and they accept you, that's fantastic. But if they don't accept you, then don't waste your time. Um, we're going to find that this message is very, very polarizing. Um, there is a section that um, I don't know that it's necessarily applied incorrectly, but it says when you don't know what to say, the Holy Spirit will, will get, put the words in your mouth. And, and we often apply that to... Uh, to the evangelism, but that's actually not what the context is. Uh, the context is after you've been arrested, then the Holy Spirit will give you words. So we'll dig into that a little bit. And then he'll conclude with saying, you must take up your cross. And, and we have to remember the cross hadn't happened yet. Um, so the disciples would have had a, a different view on what that would have meant versus what we think of when we hear take up the cross because we're living in the post-crucifixion uh, timeframe. All right, so with our Acts 17.11 thinking cap on, well, let's look at these two stories side by side. So our passage here is in Matthew 9. There is a nearly identical story in Matthew 20. Um, basically, the main differences are in, in Matthew 9, we presume we're in Galilee. Uh, Matthew 20, verse 29 says, in fact, they're in Jericho. In Matthew 9, they're actively pursuing Jesus. And in Matthew 20, this, the setting is they're just sitting there and Jesus passes by. So it's just, you know, somewhat, one's active and one's passive. But otherwise, they're, they're essentially repeated. Um, I don't know why this is, and I don't really have a good answer. But I don't know, anyone with their Acts 17.11 cap on is willing to dig into this. Um, really, no, none of the commentaries mention this. Uh, there's, there's a couple of commentaries that say things like, well, and if you look in Matthew 20, they also called him son of David, which is a term for the Messiah. But um, most of the commentaries that I have did not even address the parallel passages. So really Lancaster from First Fruits of Zion is, is the only one. So options that he presented, they're definitely two separate events um, that happen to have very similar uh, circumstances. Perhaps there are two separate events, but the stories told contained enough differences to warrant recording them separately. Uh, one was in Galilee, the other was in Jericho. Uh, option three, Matthew, or maybe even a later editor or copyist, repeated the same story because they wanted to place the Jericho healing uh, along with some of the other miracles recorded in, in Matthew 9. So that could be. And of course, uh, he didn't mention this, but I just thought of a, a fourth option is they repeated the same story twice and didn't realize that they had repeated it. So um, we do see a, a copy error that we've tackled in John chapter five. Um, but otherwise, you know, we, we presume that the scripture is inerrant. So I'm, I'm inclined to dismiss option four and just think it's um, one of the first three, whether it's two separate events or uh, if, if it is the same event, there was a reason that Matthew wanted us to, to tell, to hear the story twice. So with that said, I will go ahead and read Matthew 9, and then you can read the parallel passage. As Jesus passed on from there, two blind men followed him, crying aloud, Have mercy on us, son of David. 
When he came to the house, the blind man came to him, and Jesus said to them, Do you believe I am able to do this? They said to him, Yes, Lord. And then he touched their eyes, saying, According to your faith, be it done to you. And their eyes were opened, and Jesus sternly warned them, See that no one knows about it. But they went away and spread his fame through all that district. Now let's, the, the next healing has a, 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 the same thing going on, only this time it's in Matthew 12. And here really the main difference is uh, Matthew 9 says that he was blind, it says that he was mute. And Matthew 12 says that this man was blind and mute. And then the people um, ask a different question, but otherwise it, it looks the, the same. Um, so we'll read Matthew 9 verse 32. And as they were going away, behold, a demon oppressed man who was mute was brought to him. And when the demon had been cast out, the mute man spoke. And the crowds marveled, saying, Never was anything like this done that was seen in Israel. But the Pharisees said, He casts out demons by the prince of demons. And then in chapter 10, Jesus is going to say, basically, they called the master of the house Beelzebul. Um, and that matches the verse 24 of Matthew 12, where it says, When the Pharisees heard it, they said, It is only by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, that this man casts out demons. So again, two very similar stories that are repeated elsewhere in Matthew. So at, at least in Matthew 9, um, the setting appears to be the vicinity of Capernaum. This area uh, is the shows the modern excavations, and, and it doesn't look that you know grand. It doesn't look sparse. But we need to remember that uh, only part of this has been excavated. There's probably uh, lots of other houses um, under these under the grass area here that just hasn't been excavated yet. So let's let's not assume Capernaum was this small back in the day. It actually was a fairly significant um, trade intersection. When uh, they say son of David, um, it, that, that is, means they were identifying Yeshua as the Jewish Messiah. The, the son of David was a Messianic term. So Lancaster noted that so far, only the blind and infirm, as, as well as the demons, acknowledge Jesus as Messiah. So the blind actually saw, in quotes, uh, more than those who had eyesight. For whatever reason, um, in the Matthew 9 version, Jesus does not stop immediately, but then brings the two blind men privately to a house and then does the healing. And this is the only time that he inquired about the recipient's faith before uh, he healed. So he asked them, you know, do you believe that I could do this? And they said, yeah. So again, not, not really sure why Jesus had that uh, um, extra question in there instead of just going for it. But, uh, but there you go. Um, so then no sooner than the blind men are given sight than a mute man was brought in. And so while the blind was clearly physiologic, they, they needed to have their um, you know, nerves, optic nerves restored or whatever, whatever Jesus healed to make them see again. The mute man's issue was entirely spiritual. Um, as soon as the demon left him, he was able to speak. So um, when they say that there is nothing like this scene in Israel, that's actually an allusion to Deuteronomy 34. And I'll go ahead and read that. And there had not risen a prophet since in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. None like him for all the signs and wonders that the Lord sent him to do in the land of Egypt to Pharaoh and to all the servants and to all his land and for all the mighty power and all the great deeds of terror that Moses did in the sight of all Israel. So basically uh, no one uh, since Moses had been able to do these things. We know that certain prophets had certain power, but Basically, what they're saying here is that Jesus is the, uh, you know, he is the prophet spoken of by Moses that that is the Messiah. So now what also happens is we see that the Pharisees are beginning to step up their attacks. They had, they themselves were likely never able to cast out a demon. So they, they say, if we can't do it, then this must be not the power of God, but the power of Satan. Um, Lancaster notes that these might not necessarily have been the leadership, but these could have been other disciples of the Pharisees, similar to the disciples of Jesus. So in other words, like teenage boys, and we know how teenage boys have a tendency to think they know it all. Um, those of you with teenagers can probably attest to that. So we don't know for sure, but it, it's just interesting to consider different points of view. Jesus versus the establishment is clearly a major theme um, in, in the Gospels, and we can see that starting here. And Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every disease and every affliction. So note the gospel of the kingdom. And, and we know the specific words are repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's, that's kind of the running theme. 
When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the labors are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. And he called to him his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast out, cast them out and to heal every disease and affliction. Um, so harvest, uh, Keener notes that this is often used as an image for the end times. So the, the great harvest, and we looked at that quite a bit uh, in some of the previous lessons, so I, I won't rehash it here. Um, he also notes, Keener, that, that there are 12 apostles, 12 disciples and apostles. Um, this is an unmistakable reference to the 12 tribes of Israel. And so in Jesus' view, you know, this is the... This is the remnant, the true and faithful, obedient remnant of Israel. That's, that's kind of what the 12 is beginning to communicate. And Keener also notes that in that uh, culture, rabbis often sent their senior students out to teach while they were still students. So it's kind of like student teaching. Um, this prepared them for their own work as rabbis. So here he's about to send the uh, disciples on a mission in, in carried out in his name. And then um, he'll, he'll give them instructions and really the commission of this uh, sending out is what we're gonna see in, in Matthew chapter 10. So certainly Jesus' fame rose because of these healings. I mean, a, a man who was mute, if he's all of a sudden talking, you know, people are gonna wonder, you know, what happened? Um, every time he opened his mouth and to speak, it was a witness to the miracle. Um, whether the man you know, referenced the direct healing or not, people, he, he would have been asked questions. So we aren't told which synagogues, but in the Galilee, there are a number of uh, synagogues that have been uh, excavated and to a certain extent restored, like we see here at, uh, in the town of Katsurin, which is in the foot of the Golan Heights area. It's important to remember that um, Jesus viewed the people as sheep without a shepherd, and so he was the he is the good shepherd that comes to to lead his people. And uh, just as a shepherd has compassion over the sheep, Jesus really uh, it says he had compassion for the people. He did his miracles. I think it's important to keep in mind he did his miracles to meet the physical needs of the people first and foremost. He didn't do it uh, only to gain popularity or even to establish his credentials. Um, even though both were a true byproduct. He did it because he loved the people, and, and that's why he did he does what he does for us today, because he loves us. Um, the, the sheep without a shepherd is a reference to Numbers 27. Moses spoke to the Lord, saying, Let the Lord, the God of the spirits of all flesh, appoint a man over the congregation who shall go out before them and come in before them, who shall lead them out and bring them in, that the congregation of the Lord may not be as sheep without a shepherd. And then in Ezekiel, there are actually some harsh words for the leadership of Judah who were seen as, we could say, bad shepherds or evil shepherds. The um, Dead Sea Scrolls also have a lot of this too, that the, the temple establishment in Jerusalem is so corrupt that it is, you know, it's not a good shepherd. They're not shepherding the people. They're, you know, they're endangering the people. So the Ezekiel passage says, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Remember, these are bad shepherds, not good. Prophesy and say to them, even the shepherds, thus says the Lord, ah, shepherds of Israel who have been feeding yourselves, should, should not shepherds feed the sheep? You eat the fat, you clothe yourself with the wool, you slaughter the fat ones, but you do not feed the sheep. The weak you have not strengthened, the sick you have not healed, the injured you have not bound up, the strayed you have not brought back, the lost you have not sought, and with force and harshness you have ruled them. So Jesus came to fix the things that the bad shepherds uh, wouldn't do or couldn't do. Um, and yet we can see because of his fame, he needed to have a team to help him get the message out. And then he even gave the disciples power to do the healings um, in his name. So these are the workers that are in the field. And this is why today we call it a mission field because we are, uh, we are the laborers and we each have a role to play in this. Chapter 10, verses 1 through 4, uh, lists the 12 apostles. We're not going to do that again because we, we did that in a previous lesson. But let's just be reminded that apostle, um, it, it doesn't mean a spiritual superhero. It simply means one who is sent. So apostle uh, meant one who was a legal agent sent on behalf of the sender and with the sender's authority to accomplish the mission. And what uh, is also important is that the apostle's behavior and character reflected the behavior and character of the sender. And so Jesus in these next verses, are gonna, is gonna, he's gonna give them some practical instructions 
and then he's going to uh, you know talk about how they are to conduct themselves particularly in the face of adversity um, and it's a good thing to remember that everything we do reflects on on him he you know we are his maybe apostles with a small a today uh, we are sent to carry out a mission in his name and um, in in some respect, um, Chuck Missler used to say that the commandment that says do not take the Lord's name in vain could be uh, applied to let us not take on the Lord's name in vain. So if we're going to call ourselves a Christian, a Christ follower, our conduct needs to reflect favorably on our Lord and Master, the one who, who sends us out to do the task. Um, there's a, a, a great translation in the King James um, where Nathan is confronting David about his sin, and I think a lot of us know this passage, but if you don't, David has sinned with Bathsheba, and then Nathan, um, he, he thinks he's done it in secret, he thinks he's getting away with it. Um, Nathan brings it to his attention that it's not so secret, um, and what he says is, by this deed, you have uh, scorned the Lord, or you have shown utter contempt for the Lord. That's what most of the modern translations say. The King James, I think, nails it uh, much better. By this deed, you have given occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. In other words, your actions have greatly misrepresented uh, your Lord, uh, and you what you have done reflects poorly on Him. So, guess what? You know what what happens when we sin? You know, it's it's. Uh, it's the same thing. So this is heavy stuff, right? So being a Christian is not, not for the weak-hearted, to be sure. All right, so I'll go ahead and read, uh, starting with verse 5. The twelve, These twelve Jesus sent out, instructing them, Go nowhere among the Gentiles, and enter no town of the Samaritans, but rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and proclaim as you go, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse lepers, cast out demons. You received without paying, give without pay. Acquire no, no gold or silver or copper for your belts, no bag for your journey, or, or two tunics or sandals or a staff, for the laborer deserves his food. So as I mentioned earlier, this lengthy uh, discourse that runs from verse 5 all the way through verse 42 of, of chapter 10, it's the second of five uh, discourses in Matthew. So first was the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, the, then there's this one, and then the third was the parables, which we actually looked at um, in a different order. And then later, towards the end of the series, we'll have the community, what's called the community discourse, chapter 18, and then really the end times discourse in chapters 24 and 25. So this discourse begins with Jesus instructing the apostles that really they can either expect to be welcomed or rejected. Um, and, and if they're welcomed, they don't need to worry about provisions because the the culture of the day was you welcomed a guest and you kind of took care of the guest while while that person was under your roof so um, there's hospitality there would be food there would be provisions so uh, they, they didn't need to bring anything extra they certainly weren't allowed to charge for their services but really the instructions here are to um, rely on the generosity of, of worthy uh, what would be worthy homes it's interesting that um, at, at, towards the end of this, and as we move on, um, his instructions will transcend the immediate context, and then we'll look forward, uh, not in a good way, just looking ahead in time, to a time of trouble um, before the Messianic era begins. So he's, he's going to kind of weave into some uh, you know, end times stuff and maybe the days that, that we're living in, uh, so maybe this passage is more relevant to us than we might have thought. So Jesus gives admonition not to go into Gentile or Samaritan land. Um, this is kind of a little bit curious because he's himself has previously vis visited both Samaritans and um, and Gentiles. So in a sense, this was only a temporary injunction <laughs> to um, limit it to Israel. And so the question is why? And I think the most um, logical um, answer is that Israel was first to be given the opportunity to usher the Messianic kingdom right right then and there. Um, the, the message, the kingdom of heaven, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, meaning if you are willing and ready to accept it, uh, it is here for the taking and will you answer the call? So while many Jews individually did answer the call, as, as we read in Acts um, and then you know throughout the gospels, nationally, corporately, they did not. So my suspicion, and, and well as some of the um, commentaries I've read, is this is sort of their, 
their chance to accept. And then one of the reasons we have two, uh, two by two that they're sent out is because we need to have two witnesses to um, sort of record the rejection, if you will. So um, that's one possibility. Um, definitely uh, the day would come where the disciples would go out to the Gentile lands and, um, and, and so on and so forth. So, but for now, the, the focus was on the lost sheep of Israel, those who had gone astray from obedience uh, to the Lord. So sinners, tax collectors, harlots, you know, really anyone who would be uh, backslidden and, and ready to repent and receive the kingdom, that offer was there to them. So again, the, the message that John the Baptist gave uh, to announce the coming was repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The announcement Jesus gave in his early ministry, repent, the kingdom of he heaven is at hand. The instructions to the disciples are repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So the um, Bolin writes, the message of Jesus was consistent with the teaching of the Old Testament that God would establish his kingdom on earth for those who would receive it. Um, now that the Messiah had appeared, the nation must this is Bolin uh, writing, the nation must prepare itself for the king by repenting of their sin and submitting to God's righteousness. So again, that's an individual choice. It's also a collective national choice. And so we mentioned that sending, sending the apostles in pairs um, probably had a practical purpose of being, being safer to travel in pairs. But again, there's this legal purpose. Two witnesses were required. Um, God is presenting proof that he is fulfilling the contractual terms of the Hebrew Bible. And so a record of those individuals who closed their doors literally and figuratively was probably logged. I mean, Revelation mentions a book of death um, in which sin, a person's evil deeds are recorded and the penalty is cast into the lake of fire. Uh, and again, that's that, um, that's that great white throne judgment time. Um, and I, I think one purpose here might be when that unbeliever faces judgment, you know, they might say, Lord, you never gave me a chance. And then, and I think, you know, <laughs> as you might say today, there could be con conclusive video evidence uh, presented um, containing at least two witnesses where, uh, where someone shared the gospel, yet the person rejected the call. So um, just, just speculation, but it seems to fit. Whenever you go into a town or village you enter, find out who is worthy in it and stay there until you depart. As you enter the house, greet it. If the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. If it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. And if anyone will not receive you or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet when you leave that house or town. Truly, I say to you, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah than for that town. So again, we're reminded that uh, the Hebrew of that day was action oriented. Well, Hebrew is action oriented. So when you hear the command Shema, it didn't mean just to listen or to give intellectual assent. Uh, Shema Israel means to own the words and you know, listen and obey kind of thing. The action had to follow. Um, Shalom is in, in much the same way. It, it's, it's the Hebrew word for peace. And it's not just a simple greeting. It was more like a, a blessing. So when it's, when he, when Jesus says, um, you know, if let your peace come upon it, um, that means uh, shalom alechem, means peace be upon you. And it's really a, a blessing in its fullest meaning. Um, Dan Stolbarger says to wish someone shalom means may you have God's perfect peace that existed before the fall. And that is, that's quite a blessing. Um, and then you, we wouldn't pronounce such a blessing on one who was unworthy to receive it. So again, when uh, Jesus talked in the Sermon on the Mount, don't cast your pearls before swine. If people can't or won't listen to what you're having to say, then it's probably best not to waste your time or energy. And then a town that did not accept the two sent apostles was actually behaving worse than Sodom. Because in Sodom, the two angels at least found hospitality and safety in the home of Lot. Regardless of whatever else happened, you can say that they were afforded protection. Um, whereas these towns that reject the two apostles here are, are behaving even worse than, than Sodom is. Um, let the dust, uh, shake the dust off your feet. That's a protest. Um, Acts 13 records Paul and Barnabas shaking the dust off their feet. Um, it's, it's a way of pronouncing, I think, guilt. So the guilt phase has been, the phase of the trial has been decided. And, uh, you know, after the guilt, we know comes the penalty phase. And we read about that in, in Revelation.
in addition to sending out the 12 in Luke 9, um, so that we have Matthew 10 and Luke, Luke 9 as a parallel passage, uh, Luke 10 records sending out 72, or some manuscripts say 70, and the instructions are nearly identical. So um, really, unlike our Matthew duplications, this one is clearly a separate event, even though Jesus is using the same words. Um, I remember when I did corporate training around the country, I would often you know, repeat, <laughs> um, repeat words at each different site, even though the location was different and the setting and context and audience were different. Um, but I used the same words. And so this, this may be kind of what's going on here. Um, it's, it's a different setting, a different commission, but it's, it carries the same weight. Uh, Lancaster notes that this could be uh, up to a year, or perhaps even more, um, after the sending out of the 12. And so just to compare, uh, by the way, <clears throat> I should have had you read Luke 10, uh, just, just to get a comparison. Uh, so pause here if you want and go back and read Luke 10 and then uh, compare and contrast. Um, many scholars believe that the Matthew 10 sending out of the 12 would have been limited to Galilee. Whereas the 70 uh, occurs after the event at Caesarea Philippi, and that's where uh, Peter's uh, you know, proclamation is. And then really, that, the Caesarea marks a, a bit of a sea change in the ministry, and we'll look, look at that, um, I think, in Lesson 28 coming up. Where after Caesarea Philippi, it's all about uh, Jesus becoming more vocal that he's going to have to go up to Jerusalem to be arrested uh, and, and, and suffer and, and die. Um, so scholars see the sending out of the 70 or 72 as kind of fanning out in this area. And then in this case, indeed into Samaria and Judea, Judea and Perea. And then basically he, he is sending them out ahead and then they're going to all meet up in Jerusalem. So we'll cover this more in, in Lesson 28. But uh, since the words in Luke 10 are so similar to Matthew 10, I just wanted to point that out here. Behold, I'm sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves, so be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Beware of men, for they will deliver you over to courts and flog you in their synagogues, and you will be dragged before governors and kings for my sake, to bear witness before them and before Gentiles. When they deliver you over, do not be anxious for how you are to speak or what you are to say, for what you are to say will be given to you in that hour, for it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of Father speaking through you. Brother will deliver brother to death, and the father his child, and children will rise against their parents and have them put to death. So these are dark days. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. When they persecute you in one town, flee to the next. For truly I say to you, you will not have gone through all of the town of Israel before the Son of Man comes. So again, we can see a, a dual view here. Certainly the first century church experienced persecution. Um, first by Paul, and then Paul himself uh, <laughs> experienced it. Um, Jesus is going to use similar words in, in that last of the five discourses in Matthew 24. Um, the time of tribulation immediately before the, the advent of the Messianic kingdom is, is going to be dark days, particularly for believers. Um, but then Jesus gives a promise here to the one who endures. Um, basically, that I, I read that as the same as the, the promise to the overcomer that is in Revelation 2 and 3. So Revelation 2 and 3, seven letters to seven churches, extremely worthwhile study if you've never done it. Um, it of all of the parts of Revelation, much of it is in the, the future, but the seven letters to seven churches is uh, are things that we can apply there um, because all churches have the same problems. Um, all believers have the same problems that all churches do, interestingly enough. Uh, we all want to think that we're the Philadelphia, which is basically the perfect church missionary, um, kind of on fire, but we, we can't be that all the time. Um, and so it's just good lessons to see what, how we think we're doing and how, how Jesus sees these churches is doing. What is also interesting and maybe a surprise is that given the specific order they in, they're in, they also lay out all of church history. Uh, that's kind of bad news for us because we're living in the age of the Church of Laodicea, which is that the seventh church. Um, that's the comfortable church, the the compromising church, the lukewarm church, the church where Jesus is not even allowed inside. He's pictured as standing outside, knocking, um, knocking on the doors to be let in. And so, as we see, a lot of our churches today, even our um, what we might consider conservative churches, 
sort of getting into the politics of the day that may be good, that may be bad, but when when you go to church and you hear an entire sermon on something that is uh, political or cultural and there's no Bible, um, to me that's a problem. So <laughs> um, I'll, I'll leave it at that. But I think you know there's there are clear parallels to uh, the Church of Laodicea and the 21st century church, at least in America. So a vivid, um, certainly uh, ominous tone here, and, and the vivid contrast. The the, the wolves would have been, uh, you know, unclean animals, predators, um, for, whereas the sheep, clean animals, you know, very very docile usually. Um, so this section here, verse 16, it's almost a parenthesis because he's going to go back and and really continue from verse 15, um, and then we'll, we'll see that later in, in the lesson here. Um, one commentator noted that the disciples were to anticipate danger wherever possible, but don't lose your ethics or integrity, which means you know you'll need to suffer instead of fight. And because when you fight, you open yourself up to legal troubles. Um, in some situations, the the foes will even be bad shepherds, right? Or or the the synagogues in their day, or perhaps in our day, our our foes will be the front offices and the pulpits of our churches. So kind of sobering. So this would have been an example of a is an example of a synagogue that listed uh, existed in Galilee after the first century. Um, so note what is often missed is uh, when it says their synagogues will scourge you. This is a, actually an internal problem within Judaism, and it's sort of the same as if you've read up on church discipline. Um, church discipline applies only to church members. <laughs> so um, if you don't want to be subject to church discipline, don't join that church. They could have easily, uh, if they had disavowed Judaism, they would not have been subject to Jewish courts. Um, so it's it's commonly taught, and I know I go over this a lot, but it's commonly taught that Jesus is bringing a new religion. He's doing away with Judaism. Well, this this is a clear example that that can't be true, because by subjecting themselves to the Jewish law, uh, it's clear that they're still operating within Judaism. So that's the only point there. Um, he does go on to say that uh, it'll be the synagogues and then he'll go on to the governors um, and the kings. And so while submission to Jewish authority may have been optional, submission to Roman authority was definitely not. So certainly being turned over by a, a fellow Jew to, to a Gentile would have been you know, horrendous. Um, average Jews would have considered that traitorous and, and you know just something something that shouldn't happen but yet Jesus is saying these are going to be very very dark times um, verse 19 is often taken out of context to mean that the spirit will give us words in any uncomfortable situation uh, specifically sharing the gospel with someone else um, that, that's not necessarily wrong uh, and it's certainly not wrong to pray to the spirit to give us wisdom but the, let's note the context here is not about evangelizing but the context here is about what happens when you're turned over um, before Jewish courts and Gentile governors. Um, my personal feeling is the disciples in no way would have been concerned about how to articulate the gospel message. So um, basically, I, I think what's happening here is don't 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 worry about your defense so much that you, your need and desire to be risk averse is going to hamper your message. We'll see that uh, in, come up again in Luke 21. Settle it therefore in your minds not to meditate beforehand how to answer for I will give you a mouth and wisdom which none of your adversaries will be able to withstand or contradict. So the context here is is you know like a trial defense presenting uh, before your adversaries and and those who want to sentence you uh, or, or convict you anyway. Um, and so don't let that hamper your your message. A disciple is not above his teacher nor a servant above his master. It is enough for the disciple to be like his teacher and the servant like his master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebul, how much more will they align those of his household? So have no fear of them, for nothing is covered that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be made known. What I tell you in the dark, say in the light, and what you hear whispered, proclaim on the house tops. Do not fear those who killed the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both the soul and the body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny and are not and not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. For even the hairs on your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I will also acknowledge before my father who is in heaven. 
but whoever denies me before men, I will also deny before my Father in heaven. Um, so there's a lot going on here. Let's let's kind of take this uh, one section at a time. So again, um, he's not necessarily saying that his Talmudim should not presume to be superior to him, although that is certainly true. Uh, I think what is happening here is it's not that I'm better than you kind of thing. It's if Jesus um, was persecuted, then the disciples, you know, and then we can expect to be persecuted as well. Um, if the establishment, the deep state, the bad shepherds or whatever, um, you know, if, if they're going to come after Jesus, they're certainly going to come after Jesus' disciples. And, and maybe even more so because sometimes uh, thugs like to attack, you know, they don't go for the boss. They go for the, the, uh, the underling, um, if you will. So true in the first century and it's certainly true today. Um, Beelzebub is kind of funny. Uh, there's there's a bit of Hebrew wordplay happening here, and if you if you know the underlying, it's it's really kind of hysterical. Um, so Baal uh, was the name of a, a the supreme Canaanite god, and it also means master. So when Jesus says master of the house in Hebrew, that would be Baal Habayit, and Beelzebub would be Baal Zavul. So uh, something like master of the dwelling. What happens here is. Uh, uh, Beelzebub turns into a, a, a pun, a derogatory <laughs> insult used by uh, uh, the, the Jews, and it comes across as Lord of the Flies. Um, so that's that's the polite way of saying it. Um, even today, uh, so the, the ancient Ugaritic root of, of Zebul meant prince uh, in, in Ugaritic, but in modern Hebrew and Arabic it, today it means dung or garbage. So um, he's really master of the house. Um, is you know Lord of the Dung uh, if you want to talk about Satan so kind of a good insult to Satan. Um, despite the potential for harm, you know what talks about the sparrows, um, they th we shouldn't fear martyrdom is, is what's going to happen. If if death for proclaiming His word is our fate, then so be it. We need to fear God who can destroy both the soul and the body in hell. And this is perhaps another reference to the lake of fire that we see in um, in Revelation 20. Um, the sparrows is another uh, how much more argument. So if God cares for sparrows, you are greater than a sparrow. How much more does God care for you? Um, note that this doesn't mean that God's going to bail us out when things get rough. Um, in fact, we don't see that anywhere other than um, maybe uh, talking about the, the rapture. But um, I, while well, I think the rapture is a sound scriptural position, preacher rapture anyway. Um, but when the left behind craze was really in its heyday in the 90s, I was my friend and I were talking once, and it's you know, people assume that they're gonna get yanked out before things get really tough, and that's not quite what the Bible says. Um, we are, if you hold to that position, it means you'll be raptured before the. Uh, tribulation, the great tribulation starts. But Jesus says in this world you have tribula tribulation. And even in this passage here in Matthew 10, just by proclaiming the word, it's going to put us at odds with the world and, and there could be difficulties. So uh, again, we're, we're never promised that we won't be martyred, right? Uh, so just we're never promised comfort, I guess is the lesson here. The last two verses about acknowledging are particularly tough in light of what we know about Peter, right? So Peter certainly denied Jesus before men, but we can safely assume that he was not denied before the Father because he was used mightily in the early church. We talked earlier uh, when we were talking about Shalom, how there's a, a more active context to words. So while, uh, I'm sorry, active context to certain words, uh, meaning more than what our words say. So while Peter denied with his words, he did not deny with his actions. So I think there's likely a distinction that Jesus will make between a temporary lapse of, lapse of faith um, and a permanent rejection or walking away. And so I just, I have to hold my hat that, that <laughs> that's what's going on here. And, and we're not, you know, if we, get caught in a situation that we do say the wrong thing that uh, we're not, it's, it's not going to have an eternal punishment uh, kind of weight. Do not think that I've come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I've come to set man against his father, a daughter against her mother, daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a person's enemies will be those of his own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. This is a first century sword. It's kind of cool on display in, in the uh, Israel Museum. 
So these words would have challenged people's beliefs in a Messiah in a, in a certain respect. The Messiah was supposed to bring peace, right? The wolf was supposed to lie down with the lamb. We're supposed to beat our swords into plowshares and that kind of thing. Um, and indeed, this will happen. But before that time, before the time when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess, Scripture also is very clear that there's a period of tribulation. So um, even today, the world almost doesn't care what else you do. But if you make a decision to follow Jesus, you are an instant enemy. Um, and, and so it w was the same in, in, that, in that day. Um, in uh, Luke 2, where we have these prophecies over the, the newborn Jesus, one thing Simeon says is, My eyes have seen your salvation, that you have uh, prepared in the presence of all peoples a light for revelation to the Gentiles and glory for your people Israel. That sounds great. But then he turns to Mary and says, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign that is opposed, and a sword will pierce through your own soul also, so that uh, thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. So um, there's definitely this context of Jesus is a, a, a divide. <laughs> People will divide over Jesus. And um, once you make a decision to follow, uh, follow Messiah, then, you know, you, you, you planted your stake in the ground and, and you know, there's going to be people that are, are going to come against you. Um, this says, talks about, uh, you know, man against father and all that. We've talked it previously about how in a Jewish context, when Jesus says, you know, love the one and hate the other, that is referring to degrees. Whereas we tend to see love and hate as polar opposites. In Hebrew, it just means an order of preference. Um, so basically, you need to place the work of the Messiah above your family. And, and that shouldn't be that foreign to us, right? Because that's the expectation today when we have a job, right? Um, companies may speak of work-life balance, but uh, if we overemphasize the life at the expense of uh, work, you may no longer have work, right? Um, so there's, there is expected to be an order and a preference that your your unless there's a temporary emergency kind of thing your work comes first and you you know you kind of leave leave family um, leave family aside when you punch in. As if to put an exclamation point on the uh, prospects of suffering, Jesus mentions this about crucifixion. So we have to remember in this context, the cross had not happened yet. So obviously we now see it as a foreshadow of things to come. But when these words were first spoken, the uh, Jesus hadn't really emphasized, and uh, depending on, on our chronology, he may not even mention at all, the fact that he was going to suffer and die by crucifixion. So again, in that context, the, we need to remember what the disciples would have heard. They, would, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't necessarily have heard it, oh yeah, we must take up our cross just like you did because he hadn't done that yet. Um, crucifixion was something that the Romans did to thousands of Jews. It was you know, nasty. Uh, Lancaster says it's a gruesome reminder of Rome's authority and terror. Um, so basically Jesus is saying that they could lose their life for his sake. And indeed, as it played out, several of the apostles were recorded as dying by crucifixion, and nearly all were martyred in, in some form. So, But Jesus gives us hope that the end of this life is not the end of the story. So in verse 40, Jesus returns from looking into the future and sort of the era of tribulation, and he really comes back to the task at hand. So he's going to give the disciples really some more, we're back to the practical advice. So if we read verse 40 immediately after verse 15, the narrative flows nicely. So verse 15 left off with whoever does not receive them will receive a fate worse than Sodom. But then verse 40, whoever receives you receives me. Whoever receives me receives him who sent me. The one who receives a prophet because he is a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And the one who receives a righteous person because he is a righteous person will receive a righteous person's reward. Whoever gives one of these little ones even a cup of cold water because he is a disciple truly i say to you he will by no means lose his reward when jesus had finished instructing his 12 disciples he went on from there to teach and preach in their cities so um remember the the, the sent one the apostle the shiliach in hebrew is the legal agent of the sender um so it, it's like the centurion who said he was under authority meaning under the authority of the emperor if he gave an order and that order was disobeyed, it would be the same as that soldier disobeying the emperor himself, right? Um, and then the reverse is true. So if, if we are, um, if 
a so if someone receives the apostle it's the same as receiving receiving jesus himself so it's that same thought um some debate on what the reward means it doesn't necessarily have to refer to anything grand um i i know when uh when people serve on mission trips and whatnot they actually oftentimes feel like they're being blessed more by serving than the people that they're that they're serving that they're helping um there's just something that uh about being selfless that has its own reward kind of thing um lancaster concludes when you look at verse 11 verse 1 there <clears throat> that um, Jesus likely followed the path of the apostles. And he writes, after the disciples had visited the city and prepared the ground, the master followed their path and proclaimed the good news of the kingdom to those places. So um, again, many scholars assume that this was limited to the Galilee region. And um, so it would, wouldn't have been that hard for Jesus to go on that kind of multi-city uh, speaking tour throughout the synagogues there. So that uh, concludes our lesson here and uh, some application thoughts. Um, so we started with the, the healing of the blind and how they recognized, even though they were blind, they recognized the son of David, they recognized the Messiah. And again, uh, as is our theme here, the people Jesus heals are, are representative of us in, in a lot of ways. So we've been healed from our spiritual blindness and we recognize the, the Messiah. And so let's, let's not lose sight of that, but let's not take that for granted either. Um, we're also his apostles, maybe with a, a small A instead of a capital A. Um, we represent him in everything we do. We've been commissioned as his field laborers to work in his mission field. Um, and, you know, sorry to say, we should not expect the work to be comfortable. We can expect opposition, um, but at the end of the day, we can expect our reward. So um, that's it for lesson 21. Lesson 22, I believe, will be a little bit shorter. We will look at really the death of John. The Baptist and um, and then we will go on from there so I will see you in the next lesson